when YouTube was in its infancy, uh, there was a video that was the most popular video on YouTube for a year. Some of you may remember this. It was called Charlie Bit My Finger. Anyone remember this? It was a three-year-old and a one-year-old set of brothers. They're sitting together. And so the three-year-old would take his finger and he'd stick it in the one-year-old's mouth. And the one-year-old would bite it. And then he'd pull it out and go, oh, Charlie bit my finger, you know, his dad. You know, and then he'd just put it back in and the one-year-old would bite it and he'd complain about it again. And, and the dad, seemingly thinking, you know, what a charming, cute thing that kids do. Kids do these types of things. He films it and he uploads it to YouTube. Because they live in Great Britain, the father and his two boys, and his own father, the boy's grandfather, lived in the United States. And so he thought, oh, I really want him to experience this moment, to see this cute thing that my kids are doing. So he uploads it to this sort of neophyte site, and all of a sudden, it starts getting shared. You know, it gets outside of the family, and then it's shared people at work, and people are emailing each other, and next thing you know, there's viral growth of this video. And all of a sudden, it is the most popular video on YouTube for like a full year, when there was another video that was called The Evolution of Dance. So you might remember this. This was a guy that for five minutes, he performed 30 different dances. So he's like really popular dance songs, YMCA, Thriller, all kinds of things. And this got, this went viral, right? It started slowly. It didn't really pick up. He just kind of uploaded it on a lark for some friends. And then within a few months, 70 million people had seen it. And it remained at the time the most popular YouTube video until something else viral took over. And and that's how it goes, right? Like we have all of these things that belong in our collective consciousness because they have become viral, because they have started on a small scale and they have grown and they have grown. That's how the, the early Christian church was as well. The early Christian church started on a small scale with a few believers at Pentecost, and then it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And the church that I would tell you, that I would argue is probably the most critical church for this viral spread of early Christianity, for the growth of it, is the church at Antioch. Not not the church at, at Jerusalem, which is where Pentecost happened, where the church was birthed, where um, the the elders of the church and the apostles were, Not the church at Rome. Paul wrote the letter to Romans to that church. They are at the seat of the Roman Empire. And I still don't think that's the most integral to the viral spread of Christianity. Not any of the seven churches to whom John wrote Revelation, including Ephesus. There's this church in Antioch. This church that wasn't even started on purpose right? Uh, This church that was started because people were being persecuted and they fled from Jerusalem. If you go back and look at verse 19, it talks about how people fled to multiple cities and they started talking about Jesus. And next thing you know, they have a church. It's a church started by unnamed people. And then what happens is it just Oh, it takes off. There is energy in this church and there's excitement. So much so that word makes it to Jerusalem and the elders of that church decide to sit in Barnabas to see what's going on. And they do. And Barnabas goes up there and it's chaos and it's exciting and it's growing. And he says, keep going because he is an encourager. Barnabas means son of encouragement. And so he tells him, keep going. But wait, I've got one more person that needs to be a part of this. And so he goes to get Saul. Saul, who we talked about last week. Remember, that's the Jewish name. Paul, we often know him as Paul, is his Greek name that he used with Gentiles. And he had been a persecutor of Christians. And he had been converted and became a Christ follower. And he went back to his hometown of Tarsus, where he was from. So Barnabas says, let me go get Paul and bring him to you. And they spend a year together learning from this church in Antioch studying with them, praying with them, teaching them, worshiping together, being in life together. And Antioch becomes Paul's home church. Now, imagine what the Christian church in the first century might have looked like if Paul hadn't been sent out from somewhere like Antioch. If Paul had become a Christian and gone back to Tarsus and lived his life and the growth of the church happened in a different way, we don't know what that would look like, but we can't imagine a church without Paul. And without all of the churches that he planted and tended and loved 
and cared for. And so that's why I think that this church in Antioch was was the viral church that made a difference. So if we look at this, if, if we study this church, here's what I think we do sometimes when we study churches. When we study Acts, a historical book, when we look at maps, like the map out on the wall or the front of our bulletin, all of that is well and good, but we tend to take this historical view. Instead of seeing them as spiritual invitations, instead of looking at Acts and saying, what does this have to teach us today? What does this mean for our church today? If we ask that question, I, I think what we might be left with is wondering, what, what would it be like to be a church that forms and sends out? The mission of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples for the transformation of the world, right? To make disciples of Jesus Christ, not so that people's individual lives are changed and they have a personal relationship with Jesus and they just sit in their own bubble and circle. No, for the transformation of the world. At St. Luke's, our vision is to help be a, a place where the city is transformed by the love of Jesus, to do the work that brings about transformation in our city, right? The church's true and authentic organizing principle is always mission. It's always going out, being sent out. That's why we talk here about being an inside-out church. And we have inside-out habits because we don't do these things just so that we will grow to be more fruitful individually. We do them so that the city looks different and our communities look different. And when we wonder what it might be like to be a church that sends out Certainly, that's going to include folks that feel the Holy Spirit calling them to worldwide missions. We've had, we have had people that have been raised up in this church and loved in this church, and they go out into the world, and they serve in that way. And if you are feeling that call, I hope you'll let us know, and we would love to pray with you. I also think that the majority of us are going to experience the call of the Holy Spirit in a local way in a way that says you, you may not be going out into the ends of the world, but you go into your workplace. You aren't called to the nations, you're called to your neighborhood. The application is different, but the Holy Spirit calls us all to this work, to being sent out to share the mission of Jesus, the mission of, of kinship and of love and of grace, of making manifest, of making known, not just with our words, but in real and authentic ways, what the mercy of God looks like and how we as a community can be a part of that. In fact, the opportunity to be sent out into our neighborhoods and our workplaces is something that each of us has a special privilege for that doesn't extend to anyone else. Right? I don't get to do carpool with the parents with whom you get to do carpool. And I don't get to be um, in the workplace where you are in the workplace. And, you know, you don't live in the same neighborhood that you live in. We all have a place where we are privileged to be. And that's the place where God is calling us to be sent out. Like the church at Antioch that sent people out. We want to be sent out in that way. Now, look, you might be saying, well... I don't think I'm really an evangelist. I think, I think this other thing is more of my spiritual gift. But Sally, I know Sally, she's an evangelist. I'll leave that to her. Or the pastors seem great at that. I'll let them do that, right? They'll do the work of evangelizing. Let's go back to verse 19. It says, they proclaimed the word only to the Jews. And then in verse 20, they began to proclaim the good news about the Lord Jesus also to the Gentiles. This is a place where I think the CEB fails in its translation because there is a perfectly good Greek word for proclamation, for shouting something out from the rooftops, for exclaiming something that is not the word that is used here. The word that is used here is like normal everyday conversation. These scriptures should read, and then they talked with one another about Jesus Christ. They shared in their conversation with the Jews. This is the work of daily conversation. Being sent out is about chatting with people in our spheres of influence, in our circles, in our, in our groups. I want you to think about the places where you have conversations with folks, just normal, everyday conversations. And then I, I want you to also lift up in your hearts, what is the content of your conversation most of the time? 
I was really convicted recently because I was connected to someone that moved to Houston, a mutual friend connected us. And so I was telling her like, oh, here is, you know, all of the things you need to know. Here's the best pediatric dentist. And here's where we do our dry cleaning. And this is where we always get Thai, but we like to go to this place for Mexican food. And she said, well, will you tell me about your church? Yikes. <laughs> yes, of course I'll tell you about my church. I love my church, right? Um, but, but immediately I had gone to all these other things that, that are so easy to talk about, right? It's easy to talk about the Astros. It's easy to talk about, well, not always, but most of the time it's easy to talk about the Astros. It's easy to talk about a city council election. It's easy to talk about the place on the corner where we get takeout. It's important to talk about Jesus. Why is this important? Leslie Newbegin was a missionary from Great Britain to India. And when he moved back to Great Britain after 40 years of missions and ministry in India, he said that he found that the mission field in his home country, the country that says, God save the queen, was a lot harder than the mission field of India. Here's what he wrote. He said, England is a pagan society. The development of a truly missional encounter with this very tough form of paganism is the greatest intellectual and practical church, practical task facing the church. And the culture in which we live is no different, right? We are surrounded by people who claim to be spiritual but not religious, or the duns, or the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, the nuns, right? What this is, is this is a whole bunch of people that have not experienced for themselves the grace of Jesus and the transformation of their lives through mercy and love and inclusion and kinship. And so as a church, we have to decide what is going to be our call when we are sent out? Are we, like Paul Harvey famously said, the church can either be keepers of the aquarium or fishers of men. And so often churches default to being keepers of the aquarium. We need to decide if we want to be missional or do maintenance, right? A, a, a church that is focused on maintenance is a church that cares about their programs, about keeping everything the same, about the number of people in the seats, right? The, this is the church that says, hey, would you stay the same church so you can do my funeral? This is people that are only concerned about taking care of themselves. A missional church, on the other hand, a missional church which is the DNA of St. Luke's. This is a church that has always been missional. It looks out. It says, look, we care about what happens here and we want to form people and we want to love them into wholeness and then we want to send them out because we want to see our entire community be transformed. A missional church says, I see in you gifts and I see in you a calling I'm going to lift those up to you so you can live into those as well. I see a difference that can be made by this group of people. And we're on alert. We're on high alert for it. We can't just take for granted that because we have spent 78 years as a missional church that we always will. We have to grab hold of that vision over and over again and be a part of it. Like the church at Antioch that stayed in mission mode. The when the Titanic went down, the night that it went down, there was another ship 20 miles away. And that ship was in maintenance mode. They were following their checklist. They did everything right, which included turning their radios off for the night at a certain time, 10 minutes before the Titanic sent out a distress signal that they never heard. They looked out later, they were interviewed, and some of them said they thought they might have seen flares they thought they might have seen the lights of another boat, but then those lights went out. We know it's because the Titanic was sinking, not because they were turning them out for the night. There was another boat, three times as far away, 58 miles away, called the Carpathia. And they, they were in emission mode, not in maintenance mode. They had the radio on. And so they heard the distress call. They went for three and a half hours full steam ahead to the Titanic. And when they got there, a number of people had already perished. But they saved 705 people on the Carpathia. They were waiting for a call. They were listening. They were responsive. 
As a church, we can be like the Californian, the, the boat that was 20 miles away. We can do all of the right things. We can check mark what it means to be a church. We can have the programs. Or we can be like the Carpathia. We can be a church that responds to the Holy Spirit. We can be a group of people who is listening for what God is calling us to do. And then we can go. I've been rereading a book recently by Todd Bolsinger. Uh, It's called Canoeing the Mountains. And Todd Bolsinger was a pastor for a long time. He's now a leadership consultant. And he works with Fortune 500 companies. and, um, And one of the things that he wrote about in this book is that when faced with this choice of adapting or dying, the majority of people, 90% of them, won't choose to adapt. Right? So if you get to a point where you are so sick that your doctor says to you, you have to stop drinking or you will die. Or you have to stop smoking or you will die. You have to change your diet or you will die. He records a study that showed that 90% of people didn't make that adaptation. It's because they didn't think they had to. They didn't think that it was mission critical for their lives. As a church, we have to look and say, we have to always be adapting. Right? We have to always be looking around for what God is calling us to do, what's different, and living into that. Not just being settled, not just being stagnant with where we are. Our church must send or our church will end. That's what faced the church at Antioch as it was in its early stages of growth. That's what we're looking at as well too. And so if we want to use this church in Antioch as a model, there are two things that I want to lift up that they did well that we, we do and we can continue to do well. The first is that they draw near to the heart of God. So if you go back and look at the scripture from Acts 13 and verses 2 and 3 in our bulletins, it says that they were um, worshiping and fasting. And then they laid hands on Paul and Barnabas when they heard the call of the Holy Spirit, and they prayed and they fasted, and they sent them out. They were doing things that drew them into the heart of God. They worshiped, like we worship together right? They prayed, they practiced spiritual disciplines, like the inside-out habits that we practice. In chapter 11, verse 26, Barnabas and Paul spent a year studying and worshiping and teaching together. They were formed as disciples. It's like the equivalent, they were in small groups, essentially, right? They had accountability. They had other people they were walking with, they were learning with. So they were drawing near to the heart of God, And that strengthened them for the second thing that the church in Antioch did, that we can do as well, is that they were drawn into the mission of God. The mission of God, which is to make God's love known, to show people the the grace and the kindness and the, the mercy and the salvation and the inclusion and the generosity of Jesus so that they will come to know Jesus as their Lord because they've experienced all of those things. That's our goal. We are sent out to be those people that hands and feet the living body of Jesus in the world so that through us people will experience God's love and that they might come into relationship with God as well. And then they will do that for other people. That is our mission. That's the the mission that Paul went on to go and show that to all of these people. That is what we still do as well. And here's why we do this. Here's why we preach and tell everyone and witness in our normal conversations, not on a street corner, but as we're chatting with people, about the fact that there is always hope, that life comes after death, and not just at the end time, not just at the end of our lives, but now, today, today, there is still resurrection, is because we have been the people who are going through something awful and hard. And we've had a community that rallies around us, a community of believers that have loved us well. We have been the people who have done something so incredibly awful that we feel like we don't deserve forgiveness, that we're scared to even ask for forgiveness, and we have been covered in grace. It's because we have been people that have backs up against a wall, like that we don't know what our next step is. We don't know what what will come for us. We can't see the path ahead. And God is making connections. God is opening doors. God is making a way even when we don't know it. And we're able to step forward and step forward until today. We get to testify to that, to witness to that, to proclaim it, to speak it, to be sent out to share that with other people so that their lives are changed as well. Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will be my witnesses. 
When the Holy Spirit came on the church at Antioch, Paul was the witness and he went out. The Holy Spirit has come on us too. We are the witnesses. We are the ones that are called out into our, our job at the bank, into our bridge club, into our neighborhood carpool, into our golf game. Everywhere we are, we are called to go out, be the witnesses for how we've been transformed, how there is life in us after death and after pain, and how we know that's possible for other people too. That's our mission. We're not in maintenance mode. We're not waiting for something to happen to us. We're not trying to keep this place the same for your funeral. We're going out. We're transforming the community around us. God, you have given us an incredible task, a huge calling of transformation. And we know that it can only happen because of your spirit going before us, because of the way that you empower us. God, help us to see in our own lives as we reflect on all of the ways that you've been present with us, that you have shown us grace and inclusion and generosity and forgiveness and love so that we might be bearers of those things into the world in your name. We love you. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen.